take our next step in this progressive journey of learning and growing. Part 11 tonight. Here's where I want to go. That second part of verse 7 says, There's a time to be quiet and a time to speak. I had dinner with mom and pop one time this week, and I think it was Thursday. Pop looks over and he says, son, what are you preaching on this week? I said, I'm preaching on a time to be quiet. And a man who was a pastor for 65 years, he hung his head and he said, oh, boy. Good luck. He said, there is such wisdom and strength that is revealed when we recognize that not everything requires a response verbally. Not everything requires a response textually. Not everything requires some kind of a, a, a reaction to it in terms of our communication. God's word says there is a time to be quiet. Now, I don't know if there's ever been a time in human history when there's as much noise as there is in 2019. I'm not very old, but I'm old enough to know in my lifetime, there's a cacophony of noise. I, I just, everywhere I go, someone's talking or someone's on their phone or their car radio is too loud. And I just sometimes want to say, wait, can everybody just stop for a moment? I was in Costco the other day, not because I wanted to be, but because my wife wanted me to be. And I said, okay, Deb, I'll go. And we go to Costco and we head to that back section where all the meat is, you know. And, of course, people are all over. It's always busy. It's never empty at Costco. And I noticed this one individual. And this person was not only on their phone, but they were FaceTiming. You seen these folks in public? So it's them talking. It's the person on the screen talking. You hear both of them talking. This person kept holding up meat. Is this the one you want? That's not the one. They're having this conversation and all of us can hear it. I want to say, please stop. You know, one of the things about heaven that you may not have thought about, the Bible tells us in heaven there'll be no more death. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more separation. But let me tell you something else that's going to make heaven so wonderful. When you get to those pearly gates, you got to leave your phone at the door. It is going to be a no phone zone. You never thought about that before, did you? Don't you love me a little more now? Yeah. Heaven, we want to get there. Time to be quiet. There's an old saying that actually goes back, they say, perhaps to the Egyptians. Silence is golden. Speech is silver. Now, obviously, the truth of this is that there's more value in times of quietness. Time to think, a time to listen rather than always speaking, that silence can actually be more valuable than speech. I had a time in my life where I was in broadcasting. It was really the first career that I had out of high school. And we used to have an old saying that was a takeoff on that saying, silence is golden except when you're on the air. There was this thing that you were told about, and it was called dreaded dead air. In radio, you never wanted silence. Oh, no. They would say if someone's in their car and they're going up and down the dial, the radio dial, some of you have no idea what a radio dial is. I, I get it. I'm old. Right on. But they're trying to find a station, and if there's silence, they'll just keep going. They'll miss you. They said one thing as I was training and learning this profession, heading into it. Never let there be silence on the air. My very first day in broadcasting, as my career was beginning, I was all of 18 years of age. Had an opportunity, this was about that time in my life, this picture was taken around that time, I was going on the air as a broadcaster. It was the first day of spring. I was so excited. I had this shift on a radio station in Pennsylvania uh, where my, my shift started at 10 a.m., got done at 2 in the afternoon, four hours, middle of the day, beautiful could sleep in and get home at a decent hour. So it was a wonderful shift. So I'm getting ready for my very first day, something I've been anticipating for so many years, even as a kid. Couldn't wait to be on the radio. They said, after the news is done, about seven minutes after 10, have the jingle ready, play your first song, 
Come out of it, introduce yourself, start your career, start your thing, and then play some commercials, and you're off and rolling. Simple. I can do this. The news is going. I got my whole little setup ready. First song I was going to play was a song by James Taylor. Any James Taylor fans in the house? Yeah? Any James Taylor fans that can sing? Yeah? All right, John. So here's the... <laughs> Come on, man. Come on. So here's the first song I played. I'll sing the first line. You sing the second. Let's see. First of all. Shower the people you love with love. Show them the way that you feel. Come on. Give it up for John now. Woo! Right on. That's the first song I played. Shower the people. I'm like, yes, world. I'm here to shower you with love on this radio show. I come out of the song. I do my little thing, and I'm just so happy. My heart is beating out of my chest. I'm just a kid. I go into the commercials, three of them, 30-second commercials. First one plays, second one plays, third one plays, third one ends, and I got nothing prepared. After that, the commercial ends, and I panic. I have no song ready. I have no jingle ready. I have nothing ready. It's now dead air, the dreaded dead air in my first 12 minutes of my career. It's crashing and burning. What I did was I grabbed the weather report, and I started reading it over and over again. And while I'm reading it, totally panicked, I'm flailing my arms because both sides of the studio had windows, one for the newsroom and one for just the hallway for, like, uh, tours and stuff. So I'm flailing, hoping somebody will see me and come in and rescue me. And they did. And they fired me for dead air. No, they didn't fire me. No, no. They gave me another chance. Listen, it was such a painful experience. But let me bring it back down to our day-to-day -day life. The Bible says, Scripture says, New Testament or, or with James or Old Testament with Solomon, there is great wisdom recognizing times when we are to be silent. It's very hard these days. Because speech, of course, is not just verbal anymore. So much of it is typing, texting, posting. Anybody familiar with this recent phenomenon called trolls? So a troll on the internet or on social media is someone that will see something you posted, maybe on your Facebook page, and they'll intentionally uh, make a comment that's inflammatory. Something controversial, something to burn up your feed. They'll put it out there and it'll begin to generate all this vitriol and all this hatred. These trolls just look for people's sites to begin to post and Twitter uh, sites to post their comments to begin to stir up controversy. Like using words as a weapon of mass destruction. And one of the things that I've been surprised at is I've seen how much of human nature uh, is revealed because so many people will buy into it, feed into it, begin shooting back. Now you have this war of words that produces nothing beneficial. So let me tell you, as believers, one of the greatest achievements of Christian discipline is to know when to keep silent and when to speak. There is a time to be quiet. There is a time to understand that not responding shows restraint, discipline, maturity. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about cleaning out our spiritual closets and we talked about getting rid of kid stuff in mature ways. Well, one of the things that's very immature is to always feel like you have to respond. There's this inclination in so much of human nature to want to be right and pride often won't let us hold our tongue. And so as we've done in this entire series, what time is it? I've asked some rhetorical questions. Let me ask you this one tonight. And we'll just spend a few moments on this. Is it time to let your silence do the talking? Is it time to understand one of the fundamental precepts of godliness is silence. It's not responding, but waiting. 
So let me look at three different things because I believe this. I believe that holding your peace can speak louder than your words. These days, everybody wants to debate. Everybody wants to jump on anything that's offensive and it just becomes this thing out of control. But I believe in godly wisdom and in maturity and in growth, holding your peace can speak louder than your words. It can send some messages. I want to look at just three of them tonight briefly. One of the messages I believe it can send is, you're not going to feed the beast. What beast am I talking about? Oh, yeah, those guys trolling around trying to push your buttons. Those people, those coworkers that maybe they know some things about you. Maybe it has to do with your faith, and they just poke a little bit and try to see what you're made of. They try to, they try to just see if they can get under your skin. By letting the maturity, understanding the responsibility of our words, by letting that be an opportunity to hold your peace, you send the message, I'm not feeding this beast that wants to constantly argue and debate. Let me show you something else that Solomon wrote earlier in his life, uh, earlier than uh, Ecclesiastes 3. In Proverbs 20 and verse 3, here's what he says. Avoid Avoiding a fight is a mark of honor. Only fools insist on quarreling. Pull it back, y'all. Pull it back. When you feel yourself, the, the, the blood pressure going up, your, your heart rate is going up. I can't even feel mine because of this beard. But you, you feel like maybe, maybe your heart rate's going up. Somebody has, has got you worked up. That is the time. To allow the Holy Spirit to, to bring it and rein it in. Because only fools insist on quarreling. You go to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, as he's writing to young Timothy in the second book of Timothy, chapter 2. He says again, now he's reminding him, he's already told the young man and he's going to tell us again tonight too. Don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. What? Be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. I have had some recent conversations. I'm going to confess where this was going through my mind. I, I'm telling you, there were times I'm thinking I'm going to reach across the table and strangle this person. In love, though. In love. I'd be laying on of hands in love. Listen, God's word says, don't do it. Send a message by your silence that you're not going to do it. Send a message that you are going to be patient even with, I love the fact that it points out the difficult people. I can be patient with the kind and the loving and the sweet people. I don't see too many right here, but let me, let me see if I can find one. I can be kind with my friend. <laughs> I'm in so much trouble, dude. I'm telling you, my wife was over there. You know that, right? <laughs> Maturity. Responsibility says, don't be drug into the fight. Don't feed the beast. Let me give you something else, another message you can send by holding your peace, and it will send a message louder than even your words. Your silence is confidence and strength, not arrogance. Oh, it's the opposite. Arrogance and pride wants to respond. Arrogance and pride wants to be right. Arrogance and pride wants to get the last word. But, but true humility, true godliness says that silence is actually strength and confidence. Confidence in what? Confidence in the truth. I had somebody that came through this ministry over our recent journey. We've only been around about three and a half years, but had somebody, you know, people come, they check us out. Some stay, some don't. It's all part of the process. I get it. It's fine. Somebody that had come and decided they were going to go, no problem. But this person decided that after they had left, they wanted me to come meet with them so they could sit face to face and tell me everything I was doing wrong. Yeah, no. Not doing it. 
not getting pulled into something, not going to stand there and defend myself. Why? Because sometimes the silence shows a confidence in God, and the silence shows that the truth will eventually vindicate. There was a prophecy of Jesus Christ back in Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus walked this earth. Isaiah 53 and 7 says, He was oppressed, prophesying of the Messiah, and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as the sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. And hundreds of years later, centuries later, Jesus is in that Sanhedrin court. He is moments away from the crucifixion, from the the, the burial, from the, the, the wonderful resurrection that conquered death, hell, and the grave. And in that moment, they have him in this religious court, and they are slandering him. They are maligning him. They are saying all kinds of lies, one all around. They are absolutely berating him. And Matthew, first-hand view, says this. Then the high priest stood up in the middle of all that madness and said to Jesus, Well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? And fulfilling that prophecy, the Messiah, Jesus, remained silent. Why? Because he knew in just a few hours all of that slander wasn't going to mean a thing. He knew in a few hours all that maligning about there's no way he was the king of the Jews. That that, that tomb was going to roll open, that opening, and he was going to raise from the dead. And salvation's plan would be complete through him. Why? Why? Why would he debate when in a matter of time the truth would be revealed? Can I tell you wisdom in your life? Wisdom is hold your peace and let God vindicate you. Hold your peace and let the truth be revealed. I came across a quote. I want to just run this by you tonight. I'm not going to stay here long. Maybe you want to take a picture of it with your phone and, and think about it later. The person who can stand and listen to the language of ignorance and personal insult addressed to them in an offensive spirit and offer no reply exerts a far greater power upon the minds of their assailants than they could ever by words. This fellow traveler, fellow seeker, fellow believer, this is true wisdom. This is godliness. To say, even though they malign, I will hold my peace. Beautiful scripture by that same prophet Isaiah. He said, in quietness and confidence is your strength. Hold your peace. Hold your tongue. Let your actions send a message. Let me give you one more tonight. The message can also be that you trust God to be your defender. Ah, so I'm not going to be pulled into an argument. I'm going to wait and believe the truth will be revealed. And also, I'm going to trust God to be my defender. Now, you don't need a defender if there's no opposition. You ever had seasons in your life where you feel like everybody's out to get you? Oh, it's just me? Whatever. I have found myself on I-295 as people with Pennsylvania plates cut in front of me all over the place. I'm sorry, we have a few people from Pennsylvania here. We'd like to have special prayer right now for them. Can we do it? (laughs) I've had people cut me off not too long ago, and I find something happens. It's irrational. It doesn't make sense, bro, but here's what I'm thinking. They don't like my beard. They see me, and they're they're just all part of the conspiracy. They're cutting me off. They're going slow in the left-hand lane. It's all because they don't like me. Feel like everything's coming against you. But sometimes, quite seriously, there is legitimate times of opposition. You know, even the Apostle Paul said at one point, I press toward the goal. Well, you don't have to press unless there's opposition. And sometimes, in those times, when it feels like so much is coming against you, your silence 
shows your trust in God that he is your defender. Let me take you somewhere tonight I thought was interesting. We all know the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. David, young David wrote that. Oh, what a beautiful psalm. Brings such comfort and encouragement throughout life. But in that fifth verse, here's what he says. You, Lord, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In a time of opposition, where it's coming in from all sides, God says, as your shepherd, your protector, your keeper, your guider, sometimes I'm going to prepare a table in the middle of that mess. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of table, but I think of eating. We're Italian. Mange. Let's go. Sitting at mom's, sitting there on a Sunday with all the family, having the big Italian meal. When I think of table, I think of eating. Now, we had some rules at mom's table. We had a few rules. One of the rules at mom's table was you were not allowed to talk with your mouth full. You weren't allowed to do that. Mom said you can do two things. You can eat or you can talk, but you cannot do them at the same time. That's pretty gross right there, isn't it? Yeah, that's not right. So listen, think of it this way. Maybe in the middle of your opposition, maybe God is making a table. Maybe when your enemy surrounds you, perhaps it's time to just sit at the table of God and enjoy his many blessings and stop talking, defending yourself with your mouthful of his blessings, by the way, and let God be your defender. Think about it. Come on, somebody, I'll take that. I'll take that as confirmation. Absolutely. You say, they're all coming at me. i got to vindicate myself. God says, oh, no, sometimes you just scoot up under the table. You enjoy my blessings because your life is filled with his blessings, even in the midst of opposition and adversity. And in those times, God says, you let me defend you. God was talking to his people back in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 14. He says this way, the Lord will fight for you. This verse applies for somebody tonight. The Lord will fight for you. While you only need to keep, what? What's that word? Silent. Because you're confident and you trust your defender. You trust his timing. Being maligned and not speaking says, Lord, I will take you at your word. I'm going to let you fight for me. I'm going to keep silent, and I am going to remain calm. Notice he says, only. This is the only thing in moments you need to do. We've prayed. We've, we've asked others to pray for us. We've done our part. But sometimes you got to let the Lord fight for you. you got to let him speak for you. I wonder sometimes in our lives if God is just waiting for you and me to stop defending ourselves so he can jump in and do it for us. All you need to do, keep silent. Remain calm. Hold your tongue. I don't know. I don't know who's sitting around you tonight, but maybe somebody needs to have this reinforced right now. Look at somebody around you tonight and say to them, shh. Come on, tell them, tell them, shh, shh, tell them, keep calm and hold your tongue. I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to wrap up with this. One more verse of scripture. You know, my words are not important. God's words are what are eternal and important. I fill my messages with his word because that's the only thing that's going to change us. That's the only thing that's going to bring us closer to him. So let me end with one more from his precious word. Psalm 141, verse 3, Amplified Versions, says this. This is a wonderful and worthy prayer somebody might want to include in your daily prayer time, if you dare. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Make it an armed guard with a big gun, O God, please. Maybe a taser. That wouldn't hurt either. Put a guard there that's really big and strong over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips to keep me from speaking thoughtlessly. That word can also mean foolishly. 
It can mean hurtfully. Set a guard, O Lord, over our mouths. Now, there's a much lesser known translation of this scripture I want to share in closing. You may never have read the scrim version, but. (laughs) Set a guard, O Lord, over my thumbs. Let me see your thumbs tonight. Let me see your thumbs tonight. Come on, Lord, set a guard over my thumbs to keep me from texting thoughtlessly. Oh, one person likes that. I appreciate that, brother. Woo! We communicate as much with these these days as we do with this often. I've heard about millennials that break up by texting. My wife would have hunted me down and killed me in my sleep if I tried that when we were dating. Man up! Face to face. But you know, it's a different day. So much is done with texting. So why not understand that the Holy Spirit wants to help protect our communication, even through our texting, even through our emailing, even through our posting on social media. Set a guard. Sometimes the best response, church, is silence. There's a time to be quiet. Can you bow your heads tonight? I want to pray for you. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you for the preciousness preciousness and faithfulness of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for talking to us as individuals, coming from different places, different backgrounds, different challenges. And yet tonight in this house, you have talked to most of us and all of us that wanted to hear. In these closing moments, Father, I pray that you water in the seed of your word tonight. Water it in in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Let me talk to you a little bit before I let you go. It's a beautiful point of scripture that says these words. Many of us know this. Be still and know that I am God. Now when you study that word be still, it means be at peace and be silent. Stop talking. Oh, we need to to pray. We need to get that out. We've said that tonight. We need to do our part. But God says there comes a time when we just have to stop talking, stop requesting anything, maybe even stop praising, and just be still and know how much he loves you. That he's not only the God of the universe, but he is the God of your situation. He is the God that absolutely knows where you are right now. He hears the cry of your heart. He hears the the, the turmoil going on in your mind. That is the God that says, be still. He says, I'm here. Come on, say his name, Jesus. Jesus, Lamb of God. Come on, say worthy. Softly once more, Jesus. 
your name. Father, thank you again for speaking to hearts. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, the strength and the restraint of our words and our responses. Thank you for reminding us that sometimes in the midst of our battle, we are only to be still and remember and know that you're God, God our defender, God our strength, God our portion, whatever we need, be silent and trust in you. Bless every home, bless every family, bless our time of fellowship to follow. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys. Come on, let's fellowship a little tonight.